That means you got to be quiet. Don't cry on shit right now.
grace and your mercy. You so freely shed on us, Father. Lord, thank you for your, your son. He died on that cross for us, Father, so that we can have a true relationship, not religion, but a relationship with you, Father. Father, be with me, Pastor Ruben. Help us to understand the scriptures in there, Father, that you would give us double portion of your Holy Spirit, right now, Father, to minister to us, Father. We thank you for today, Father. Thank you for allowing us to be here, Father. Go before us, Father. You lead us. You guide us, Father. I pray that we will always be available for you, Father. Use us and guide us. That people, when they see us, all the neighbors, Father, when they see us, they will see you and us, Father. Thank you. Go before us. Be a Son Jesus Christ, in my pray. Amen. Let's all be with me. I'm not going to touch you. Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Glad you guys are all here tonight. As we begin a new book, the book of Numbers. So you might want to grab your Bibles and get in there and get your pins and highlighters we're ready to get through two chapters tonight. So it'll go pretty quickly. <clears throat> but before we get there, uh, our CC Inland AI. We all know what AI is, right? Artificial Intelligence. So we've got a new system, and if you go to your, your phone, and if you haven't done this yet, you can do it right now. It's pretty quick and simple. You just type in your uh, two on your texting. So just hit your text button, type in 85100, 85100. And those of you that are on, on Facebook might want to do this too. Just type into your text 85100, and in the message section there, just type in CC Inland, and then send it. And then you'll get a text back, and the text will tell it, tell you that you're signed up, but you have to type in yes, Y-E-S, and send it. And now you'll be set up. This is for the ones that aren't signed up. Hmm? You just said that for the ones that aren't signed up? That aren't signed up. Okay. If you've already done that, don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. For those on Facebook, if you'd like to sign up to our Calvary AI, you're more than welcome to text 85100, 85100, and in the message, type in CC Inland. And then when you get a text back, just type in yes and send it and you'll be signed up. You'll get invitations and opportunities to see what's going on in the church through your texting. So it's a great little system. Yard sale is coming up a week from this Saturday. So uh, grab all of your, your treasures and bring them out the Thursday, Friday before as we will be celebrating our annual uh, yard sale. And all the funds will go towards our baptism, which will probably be in the end of June or so, kind of around there. So there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please take a look at it and sign up. We have our men's luncheon this coming Saturday, May 11th, at 11 a.m. here at the church. We're going through the book of uh, Romans with Max Lucado. That first chapter is really good. 
It's really, really good. I encourage you to get the book. If you can't make it, then at least get the book and go through it. It will help you with your walk. Very important to help you with your walk so you'll grow in faith and knowledge of God. And then we'll gather together that day and have um, fajitas, chicken fajitas, and we will get into the Word. So I'm excited about that study. And we'll just kind of gather around this man and, and just dig into it. And it looks like we'll be having a men's retreat in September, the second or the third weekend of September. We'll be going up to Big Bear, uh, so keep that in prayers. Hopefully the cost is going to be right, right around $125. It'll be fishing, studying, fellowship. It'll be a neat time up there. The meeting for the women's retreat has changed from Thursday to Monday night. I hope that's not going to mess anybody up. But we will meet here <clears throat> at the church on Monday at 6.30. For the ladies that are interested in, in putting a women's retreat together. Yeah, I'm ahead of it. I am the head of it. I'm behind. You are? Yeah, I just read the bulletin today and it says Sunday after service. And now it's Monday, so I'm trying to keep up. Yeah, well, I realize that it's Mother's Day. Oh, yeah. But we can't do it. Oh, I forgot. Uh, you are. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> well, you're not supposed to remember. They are. <laughs> All right, let's ask the ushers to come forward. Let's go ahead and, and pray to the Lord. Oh, gracious Father, what, a, what an awesome song that was, Lord. Abba, Abba, Abba. Abba, Abba, Father. That is so beautiful, Lord. And that you're closer, Father, than our skin to our bones. That is an amazing yes. verse there, Lord. How can you be closer than skin to bones? Oh, because you're God. Yes. Oh, Lord, you're God. If we would only understand, Lord, how intimate you desire to be with us, Lord. The intimacy that we have with you now is nothing compared to what you really would like to have with us, Lord. And all we need to do, Lord, is ask and seek and knock you. Lord, just giving our all to you, Father, and praying that you will deepen our relationship with you, Lord, even more than it is now, that it's it's so deep, Lord, that we are willing to give our lives to you, totally surrendered, Father. Yes, and whatever happens to us, we are pleased, as, uh, as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, a living sacrifice. Wow. Yes. That's intimacy, to be able to give your life as a living sacrifice. Not that you're going to die, but you are living and you're sacrificing your ways, your thoughts, <coughs> your pride, yourself. And you're saying, Lord, let it be all about you. Let people see Jesus in us, Lord. That's a beautiful song, Lord. And now we give back to you, Father, in our offerings. Lord God, receive them. Use them for your glory, Lord. And minister to us, Lord, in your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> okay, let's open up our Bibles to Numbers. Chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm just, okay. So, Numbers chapter 1. We're going to go through two chapters uh, this evening. <clears throat> we are in no Numbers chapter 1. The theme is an army. An army. Now, if you're a guy, you know what it means to have an army. Mm -hmm. That you'd like an army. Know about you, but they used to have back in the days these little plastic form army men that had a little platform where their feet stood, and they had little <laughs> guns and rifles in their hands, and they had tanks and all kinds of things. And you'd lay them out on a board, and you put them there, and you'd buy as many pieces as you could, and you would play army one side against another. I like my army because I'd wipe out the other army and I'd just do that with my arm. Just there you go. An army. And God is creating an army here like no army has ever been created before. Now why is God starting an army? That's the question. Why did God allow the pilgrims to come into this land and change the culture? That's another good question. You know, we, we hear a lot about this from the Democrats 
you know, people that are very liberal. And that here we are trying to keep people out of our country, and yet, weren't we immigrants? Weren't you immigrants? Weren't you immigrants when you came to this country? How is that? I wasn't. My ancestors lived here. We were born here. So weren't you immigrants? So uh, why should we build a wall? So why would God start a war? Why would God take away a land that belonged to other people? Why would he do that? It doesn't sound like a very nice God that he would, you know, uh, go into that land and pretty much wipe them out and take it over and then say, this is my people's land. Yeah. See, there's something there. I'm, I'm getting to a point here for the United States of America. See, God has a plan and that plan started in Genesis chapter 3 because man, Adam, and woman sinned against God. And so God made a plan that through the woman a seed would come and would save all of humanity. That seed was Jesus Christ. And Jesus told his disciples, I want you to wait in the upper room. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, just and empower you, you're going to go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and preach the gospel to the world. That's why. That is why God took Israel and pushed them towards the land of Canaan and judged all the nations because they wouldn't turn to him. So he judged them, which he will do in the end times, an ultimate judgment, but this was a type of the judgment that would come. And then his people took the land. His people dwelt there. It became their land because of his promises. Now, same thing is true of us today. The gospel still is getting out. And before uh, the pilgrims came here, there were savages here. They were idolatrous worshipers that did not turn to God in this United States. Well, they called the United States back then, but the new land. And so what did God do? Through his province, he sends a group of people that just want to worship the Lord into this land, and they began to grow and take the land over. And then God said, this is your land. And he created the United States of America. And so... It was God's purpose and plan to create the United States of America. Only God can do that. And so the reason that we want to wall up there is to keep out the criminals that would disrupt what God has already created in his plan for the United States of America. <clears throat> so you see, God can create an army. God can go into a land and he can take it over because it's his land. It's his creation. He created the heavens and the earth, and he can do with it as he sees fit. So the reality is, I thank you for coming to America, because if you did not come to America, the gospel would not be here, and I would be going straight to the pit of hell. But because you came to America, you set our people free by preaching the gospel to us, and so we can receive Jesus Christ. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense to you, then... Pray a little more. Because God can create an army. Now, I just want to touch on one other point. This army that he's creating is also a type uh, of army that we're involved in. See, this was a physical kingdom that he was creating with the children of Israel. He was the king. The children of Israel were to follow him into the land of Canaan. And they were going to literally fight. But the fight and the battle wasn't just theirs alone. God was going to fight for them. And, and we will see that as we go through the, the Old Testament, that oftentimes it was God who gave them the victory. Many, many times it was God who gave them the victory. Gideon, I want you to get up and I want you to fight. And so he brings 3,000 men and God says, no, that's too many men. I want you to go with 300. <laughs> so get rid of this. And Gideon's like, that doesn't make any sense. God says, don't worry about it. I got it. So God gave him the victory. So we'll see that throughout uh, the conquering of the land of Canaan. Uh, you remember Joshua was standing there and all of a sudden the Lord of, uh, the uh, commander of the Lord's army appeared before him. This was an angel of the Lord and he was the commander of the Lord's army. And then we see another where an angel destroyed 185,000 enemies of Israel. So it was God's battle. And so here we go back to the typology 
Here we are now, not in a physical kingdom like they, but we're in a spiritual kingdom. A spiritual kingdom. We belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Jesus Christ came to create. And he even said, my kingdom is now. It is a spiritual kingdom, and there are battles to be fought, not against nations, powers, and principalities of the air, but against spiritual hosts, battles that we are ourselves battling with, our flesh, the temptations, the pride, the self, the lies, all of these things that we do, there's a battle going on within ourselves to battle that. Thus, we are conquering the land of Canaan in our very own lives, every one of us. But it's not us. We are to put on what? The armor of God. So the battle belongs to the Lord. We are to put our faith and trust in Him and leave the battle in His hands as we battle. So you see the similarities of Israel fighting this, within this army into the land of Canaan and us fighting within the kingdom of God over the land of that we're dealing with our own hearts, our own self sinfulness. So here in the context of chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, God is, is numbering his army, and it is a huge army. This is the kind of army where guys are like, man, I'd love to have seen that. Because you're talking millions of people in an army. And I'll give you a perspective of that as we go through this. So let's look at the purpose of the census, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the tabernacle of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. You remember, they had come out of the land of Egypt. God delivered them through the Red Sea, and they landed right there at Mount Sinai in this wilderness area. And God was up on Mount Sinai ministering and directing and leading Moses to be the leader of the children of Israel. And they have been encamped there now for a while. As Moses met with the Lord in the tabernacle, God commanded him to take a census of the congregation of the children of Israel, but only counting all who were able to go to war. So this census was not necessarily the census like David, if you've ever read David's story, and how David wanted to number, take a census of his army so he can show how powerful he was. That's arrogance and pride. That's arrogance and pride. See, any time that we do or say things to puff ourselves up and to make ourselves look good in front of others, that's pride. That is pride, and pride will only destroy, right? Pride will cause us to stumble. We need to be humble. You know, if we get anything done, it's only because the Lord has helped Amen. us get it done. But some of us pull the glory from Him and say, look what I've done. If it, if it wasn't for me, this wouldn't be going on. That's pride. No, if it wasn't for the Lord, you wouldn't get anything done. And David didn't number them for that reason. And so God judged him for that. Now Moses here is numbering because the Lord commanded him to number, but not everybody to show how powerful they were, but to just number those that would be in the battle. Those men at a certain age, and we'll get to that later on in the different books, but he numbered those there. And by comparing this with Exodus 40, which says it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. It can be seen that the tabernacle was now, has now been set up for a month. And the people have been camped there in Mount Sinai for nearly a year, waiting upon the Lord to direct them. So verse 2 says they took a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their families, by their fathers, houses, according to the number of names, every male individually. Uh, census in ancient world were used as a means of drafting, right? You, you're going to do a draft, and we're going to draft a certain age of men for military purposes or government purposes. Even in building projects, uh, they would use census to see how much manpower they had. Uh, who they could uh, draft into to help them. But in this case here, um, it is dealing with the battle that they're going to fight in the land of Canaan, and God wanted to number them. Now, it wasn't because of their numbers that God wanted to show them their power, but in spite of their numbers, He's going to show them power. So verse 3 says, From 20 years old and above, 
all who are able to go to war in Israel. Guys like me couldn't go. I'm 20 above, but I'm crippled. So for me to go is out of the question. But the strong men, the young men, the ones that were willing, later on we're going to see that uh, if you were married, you, you weren't asked to go because you had a family. You'd stay back. But it would be the young men, the men that weren't married, the men that didn't have responsibilities and children and, and so forth. And it wasn't the older men either because guys, those guys don't move very fast. In their minds, they move very fast, but they're really slow. <laughs> they just think they move fast. I think I move fast, but sometimes I'm like, why did that take me so long? I'm like, oh, could I hurt? Bending over and doing that. So this was mainly a military census to see who would fight on behalf of Israel in taking the promised land. In a sense, too, it was preparing their hearts, right? We're going to the promised land. And these guys are going to all battle within this promised land. And it's supposed to excite them, to get them ready, to see the power of God. They've already experienced the power of God. They know the power of God through the Red Sea, deliverance of Egypt, the, the water and, and you know that God gave to them and so forth. So this was the first step of taking the promised land and inventory to see where Israel was and what Israel had to get where God wanted them to be. And though the promised land had been mentioned during the Exodus to this point, the focus has been on getting to Mount Sinai and receiving the law. That was just the beginning, though. This was just the beginning. The focus now turns on taking the promised land and recognizing there's going to be a battle ahead of us. And by the way, we are always in a battle. You will never, never stop fighting. Never. And as Christians, we need to understand that. You'll always be in a battle. But do you know that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes our battles are because of our own decision making. Because we make the wrong choices. We choose certain things that God says don't choose, and then the consequences are on us. And then we blame everybody else. And that's sad, that when it's really us. No, we're in a battle, and it doesn't stop. Now, why are we in a battle? Why does God allow a battle in our lives? Why does he allow suffering and pain? Is it because he wants you to fight someone? No. Because he's trying to show you something. That's so important, guys. You know, when you're in a battle, when you're in a discussion, when you're in a heated debate, it's not about the other person. It's about you. It's about me. How am I going to respond? How am I going to be humble? How am I going to decrease and let God increase in my life? It's about dying to self. Mm. Paul said that very clearly in Corinthians. I believe it's uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Uh, he makes a very, very clear point here. Um, I want to just kind of see if I can read it to you, if, if it is chapter 4. Um, if not, then I'll, I'll say sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> He's talking about how ministry is and how the struggles of ministry uh, are upon him. But those struggles are causing us to die uh, to self. Um, he talks about being pressed in, about the pressures yet not destroyed, about ministry. He's, he's talking about the, the battle and the fights but yet God not destroying us, but it's, it, it's working in us death, a death that is um, something that we, we don't really like. We don't like death. We don't like to, to die to self. We would rather live. We would rather fight. We would rather um, battle than, than die to self and let God uh, take care of, of things. Yeah, I can't find it. This point. If you can find it, that would be great. It's in 2 Corinthians, and it's talking about Paul when he's being pressed in and pressured and, and all of these things that we don't necessarily uh, like. I'll have to get it for you later. <clears throat> Someone's on Facebook going, It's 2 Corinthians, blah, blah. <laughs> so let's continue. Now he begins to number the heads of the tribe here. Now this will go rather quickly. Verse 4 through 16, uh, there are some tribes that he numbers. So it says with, in verse 4, With you there shall be a man from every tribe, every one, the head of his father's house. So Israel was organized according to tribes that descended from the original 12 sons of Jacob. 
later renamed by, by God. So he's separating them within those different groups. And each of these 12 tribes designated one who was to be the head or the father that oversaw that tribe with their standard. In a sense, this is a representative from form of government for them. A form of government in order that God is leading and guiding and they are in a military uh, order to battle. And each one is over those uh, different tribes there. And verse 5 says, These are the names of the men who shall stand with you from Reuben, Elzur, the son of Shadur. So 12 tribes are mentioned, but not the tribe of Levi. And you'll see that in a minute. He does not take the tribe of Levi and name them. Yet the number 12 is still remaining because of the sons of Joseph who had what? Two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So you still see 12 there, even though the Levites are not listed in those leaders there. Now this was a military census again, and the absence of the tribe of Levi among uh, the potential soldiers is important, but it will be explained later as we go through. We'll see that. So from verse 6, from Simeon, Shemiel, uh, the son of Zur Ish Hadiai, from Judea, Nashon, the son of Amimadad. This was the head of the house of Judah. And he's mentioned here later on in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, verse 4. Important guy here. He shows up in the New Testament. And then he goes on and he lists, lists uh, the heads here of, of Issachar, verse 8 which is Nathaniel, and then the son of Zor, and then Zebulon, another son of Jacob, uh, Eleb, the son of Heon, uh, from the sons of Joseph, from Ephraim, Elishma, the son of Amimahad, from Manasseh, Gamamil, the son of Padahurj, and then in verse 11, Benjamin, another son, Adadam, the son of Gideonai, and then the son from Dan, Ishir, the son of Amish Hadai, and then Asher, uh, Pagliel, the son of Esh or Ochran, and then Gad, Elisheth, the son of Duol. Now, interesting, some of your Bibles may say Ruel, uh, but there's no conflict there because a the Hebrew letter uh, for Diel or Rish often are interchangeable. So, whether you have an old King James or a new there. You might say, wait a minute, I don't see no deal. It's at the real, so same person. From Nephilim, a higher, the son of Ean. These were chosen from the congregation, leaders of the fathers, tribes, heads of the divisions of Israel. And now we see um, here in 17 to 19, now that they have selected these leaders, whether it was through voting or what, they were chosen and they now have become the leaders of each of those tribes. We see the assembly of these leaders in verses 17 through 19. It says, Moses and Aaron took these men who had been mentioned by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they recited their ancestral by families. Wouldn't that be a scene? You're talking hundreds of thousands of people, and then they start reciting their ancestry. You know, it would be like us saying, I'm... You know, so and so, and my father was so and so, and his father was so and so, and his father was so and so, and you're listing your whole ancestry and where you came from, and then boom, from the tribe of Reuben. He goes on and says, By their father's house, according to the number of names, from 20 years old and above, each one individually, as the Lord commanded Moses, so he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. So they still haven't left, they're still being numbered. So the leaders of each tribe was responsible to count the potential soldiers in their own tribe and then gather to get together a report and give it to Moses. Every individual was important to God. They were all part of that report that was given to Moses. Now we come to verse 20 and 21. We see the tribes as he breaks them up into numbers on the census. So we come to the tribe of Reuben, which has about 46 thousand potential soldiers. Now, 46,000, what does that number look like? Well, if you go to Eastvale, they have about 54,000. So it's about the size of Eastvale. You ever drive to Eastvale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty big. 
So can you imagine that many people just in the tribe of Reuben? It's the half, it's about half mark for all of Harupa Valley. So you take Harupa Valley, you divide it in half, that would be roughly around 50,000. So it says in verse 20, now the children of Reuben, Israel's oldest son, their genealogies by their families, by their father's house, according to the number of names, every male individually from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war, those who were numbered of the tribe of Reuben are 46,500. And then we come to the tribe of Simeon. His tribe has 59,000. 300. So they are a little closer to Israel size. Now you have with Simeon and, Ju and Reuben together about the size of Harupa Valley. That's how many people. I mean, that's a lot of people when you think about it. A lot of people. So from the children of Simeon, their genealogy by their families, by their father's house, and those who were numbered according to the number of names. Each male individually from 20 years old and above and all who were able to go to war. Those who were numbered of the tribe of Simeon. Now he's going to repeat that over. Now we come to the tribe of Gad. I'm, just, I'm not going to read it now because it's the same wording. Gad has 45,000. So pretty good size. So it's like Harupa Valley and Eastvale together now. The number of people. Then we come to the tribe of Judah from verses 26 to 27. They literally have the most people. They have 74,600 potential soldiers. So that's like taking Eastvale and then another half of it, of soldiers, and then adding that with the rest. So you're seeing the potential that's going on here, right? And how it's growing. Then the tribe of Issachar has 54,000 potential soldiers. And then verse 30 through 31, the tribe of Issachar, uh, I'm sorry, not Issachar, um, the tribe of Zebulon has a total of 57,400. And then the tribe of um, Ephraim has 40. 1,500. So it's getting a little smaller here, verse 32 and 33. And then uh, we see the tribe of Manasseh, 32,200 potential uh, soldiers there. Now it's interesting because Ephraim uh, above 8,000 8, more than Manasseh towards the accomplishment of that promise that we see in Genesis 48. Because in Genesis 48, it tells us that Ephraim will be above Manasseh. So it actually has a bigger army than, um, Ephraim has a bigger army than Manasseh because of Genesis 48, God promised that they would. And so it's true, God kept this promise and they have a bigger army, about 8,000 more uh, than Manasseh did. And then we come to the Benjamites. This was the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, this is the son that Jacob loved. You remember him? And how Jacob loved him and, and actually uh, went and visited him and brought his whole family during the famine there in, in Egypt. Benjamin, uh, that tribe, was the tribe that Paul the Apostle belonged to. Uh, so very famous tribe, but they had 35,400 uh, potential soldiers. And then the tribe of Dan had a potential of 62,700 soldiers. And the tribe of um, Asher were 41,500 soldiers. And Nephilim, 53,400 potential soldiers. Now the summary, look at this now, the summary of all the men that were ready to go to war, potential men, were 600 and th 603,000 men. 550,000. That would be like Six Harupa Valleys. Big. Now, the question is, the question is, how does God maintain an army like that? Some commentators said that's impossible to maintain. That's a lot of people. So how could they survive? How could you feed them? How could you want How could you communicate with them? Well, that's what the banners are for. That's what the trumpets are for. You know, and then God is able to communicate with them. And then you see Moses in the midst of 600,000 people, and he's the one directing them, as God is directing him. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment when you think about it. But that is the power of God. Yet it was nothing compared to what they were going to battle. In verse 44, it says, These are the ones who were numbered, and Moses and Aaron numbered with the leaders of Israel, 12 men, each one representing his father's house. So all who were numbered of the children of Israel by their father's house 
from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war in Israel. All who were numbered were 603,550 men. Pretty amazing when you think about it. Now, the first census, Manasseh is the smallest tribe, and Judah is the largest tribe. And there are two tribes in the 30,000s, three tribes in the 40,000, four tribes in the 50,000, and one tribe in the 60,000, and one in the 70,000. At the end of the book of Numbers, uh, years later, he's going to repeat this census, and the numbers are actually not going to be way off. So they don't lose very many people. God actually preserves them. The numbers are different in the different tribes, but not too many are lost because of that. Now we see the special case for the Levites here in verse 47 through 54. So why didn't the Levites get numbered? Why did they get spared from battle? What were the Levites? Do you remember? They were the what? They were the priests. What were they supposed to do? Maintain the temple. Worship. Offer sacrifices for sins and so forth. They were the ones serving the people and serving God. So it says in verse 47, The Levites were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. For the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor take a census of them among the children of Israel. But you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony. That's their responsibility, to take care of the temple. Today you have a pastor. His responsibility is to take care of the church. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, his responsibility is to be teaching, to be studying. He should not be setting up chairs. He should not be cleaning. He should not be occupied with these other things that other people can be doing. He should be focusing on teaching the Word of God, counseling God's sheep, encouraging, strengthening, correcting God's sheep. This is his responsibility just as the Levites were to take the offerings for the people in the tabernacle, take the uh, sacrifices, uh, the daily ones, uh, have worship, enter the Holy of Holies before the Lord, offer up sacrifices for the whole nations. That was their responsibility. They weren't to go outside in battle. They weren't to fight in the war. They were to stay in the temple and take care of the temple, the tabernacle of testimony over all the furnishings, over all the things that belong to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings. They shall attend to it and camp around the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall set it up. The outsiders who come, comes near shall be put to death. They were responsible for the tabernacle of God. They actually were in the center of this great army. Uh, it's Chuck Missler who said, if you were to take an uh, aerial picture of the army and how God set this up, you'd actually see a cross. You'd mm. see the center being the tabernacle, where God, Jesus, was in the center of that cross. And then you see the different tribes in, in, in a cross shape. And the Levites were right there in the middle. Who is, who is the, really the great high priest? Jesus himself, which the Levites were a type of, Amen. of Jesus himself. So, the beautiful picture there. And if anyone came in and disturbed that, from the outside they were put to death. Um, I think that's why God says, be careful not to touch God's anointed. Uh, when you come up against God's leadership, you need to be careful. You know, if you disagree, then disagree agreeably, right? Mm. You just disagree agreeably. Amen. We can still live with that. The children of Israel shall pitch their tent, everyone by his own camp, everyone by his own standard. What's the standard? It's usually a stick with a flag on it, and they each have their own standard uh, picture, some suggest. Now, there are some suggestions of what they are, but the text doesn't tell us exactly what it is. Uh, so I'm not sure what it is. It could have been a lion, a man, a picture of something, or it could have been their name, maybe in Hebrew, you know, maybe it's a, a stone color, uh, of each, because they had the 12 stones on the Ephraim mm -hmm. uh, of the priests and so forth. We, we just don't know. But it's a standard according to the army. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of testimony that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the children of Israel. Now that's interesting, isn't it? They needed to maintain the tabernacle, the sacrifice offerings. Why? So that there's no wrath on the children of Israel. 
kind of sounds like the church today, or people that say, I don't need to go to church. And they're living not under the covering of God, but they're living their own, um, their own idolatrous worship because they're not worshiping a God in a building, in a place where God has called them to serve. And we saw that this Sunday, how Paul said that he went to the churches. Uh, we see it in Hebrews, how God says, do not forsake the assembling. And the word assembling uh, in the Greek actually is building. Not assembly, like you'd have an assembly where people just gather together. It's a building where people gather together. That's what the Greek is. It's not talking about just gathering anywhere because someone might say, well, we could just be in a house without a pastor, without a leader. No, no. You need to be in a church. Um, they run into more trouble because they're not under that covering that God has created. Not just this church, any church. I'm not talking about just us, but to the church itself. <clears throat> so, verse 54, Thus the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded they did. Now, because this was a census of potential soldiers, the tribes of Levite were not counted. They alone among the tribes did not go to war because they had special responsibility to God for the priestly duties of Israel. Now, this is what's interesting here, guys, is that as you look at this, I want you to see something that's taking place here because God is creating a form of government and it is a government that is in order. There's an orderly process in it, right? And it reflects our God himself. So I want you to keep that in your thought. Now let's go to chapter 2. Uh, the theme of this is the, uh, the army, part 2. So let's get right into it. The command, the, the command to arrange around the tabernacles taking place of the tribes and the leaders of the army. Uh, they're going to arrange the tabernacle. They're arranging everybody where they're going to be within uh, this army. Uh, so this is going to create that cross, as I said. So verse 1 says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard, besides the emblem of his father's house. They shall camp some distance from the tabernacle of me. So the center, the tabernacle, the Levites are there, and now he's telling them where each one will be camped with their own standard and their own tribe. Later on, we'll see that each tribe had to stay with their own tribe, right, and marry their own own people too. Um, even in the lands and the dealings, you know, they had to do it within the tribes. You married, and the land stayed within those tribes. Verse 3 through 9, the tribe encamped to the east of the tabernacle. So if we're facing east this way, Right, east is that way. So, the tribes that were on this side, as the tabernacles in the center. So, on the east side, towards the rising of the sun, those of the standard of the, of the forces with Judah shall camp according to their armies. And Nishon, the son of Abimadad, shall be the leader of the children of Israel. <clears throat> now, why is Judah in the front? They're the biggest army, right? They had the most people. That's where the power is, like a bulldozer. And then the rest are coming in that are a lot smaller. They couldn't handle it. It would break the ranks immediately. Because you want to go into a battle and you want to go with force and power immediately. Otherwise, your men get discouraged when they see them falling because you're a smaller group. So it makes sense that Judah would be the first to go. <clears throat> and verse 4, his army was numbered at 74,600. Uh, those who camped Next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar, and Nathaniel the son of Zer shall be the leaders of the children of Israel. And his army was numbered at 54,400. Then comes the tribe of Zebulon, and Eleb the son of Helon shall be the leader of the children of Zebulon. And his army was numbered at 57,400. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces of Judah, 180. 6,400 shall be, uh, these shall break camp first. So they're all in the front, right? 186,000, all in that front. So you get the picture, they're in the middle, and this front goes a little long, like 186,000 long. Now, you take the, the city of Rupa Valley, double it, and of course you're gonna be a little smaller because you're people, not houses, but it's 186,000 people. The, the uh, Anaheim, Angel Stadium, how much does it hold? Something like 24,000. So you take that 
and you multiply it, was it more than that? I don't know. I thought it was somewhere around that when I hear the harvest numbers, they always say 24,000 came out or something, was somewhere around that. But you take that number and you multiply it by what, six times? Yeah. Six stadiums of people and they're just right in the front, all standing there ready to go, right? Then we come to the other tribes on the south side now. Now get the picture, center, it's long in the front. Now we're getting the south side of the cross. On the south side shall be the standard of the forces with Reuben, according to their armies, and the leaders of the children of Reuben shall be uh, Elazar, the son of Shadir. And his army was numbered at 46,500. And then it goes down, and it says the same thing, the tribe of Simeon. And then after Simeon, there's a tribe of Gad. And after the tribe of Gad, uh, there's the, ar the armies. Okay, let's see, Gad, Zebulon, and that's it. They're in the back, so three more tribes in the back, totaling 151,000. Going on the back side now. Now we have the tribes uh, in the, the middle. He's, he mentions here is the tribe of Levi, verse 17. And the tabernacle of meeting shall move out with the camp of the Levites in the middle of the camp as they camp. So they shall move out, everyone in his own place by their standards. So here's the tribe of Levite. They're in the center, the priestly taking care of the tabernacle. In verse 18 to 24, we see the tribes that are on now the west side. The west side. I'm sorry, so I got that wrong. The south side's this way. North. That's north. East. east. So you have this out right now. Now the south side would be this side. And the south side is west. Ephraim and his group. Um, not only was it Ephraim, but it's Manasseh and all of his group. And then Benjamin and all of his group. And that was a total of 108,000 that were on the, the um, west side. So that was behind them. And now we're getting that form of the cross. And then the next group was the north side, this side here. I'm getting my compass wrong. <laughs> my, grand, my grandkids would always say, how do you know that's north? Because I always see the mountains. That's always north. And when you're pointing north, your right is east. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard to figure that out in Israel, which way was you know, east and, and west. And then I realized if you're looking towards the Sea of Galilee, that's north. So then this side would be east and towards the Mediterranean would be uh, west. So I got used to that. But reading it is a little different, huh? So the north side, the standard of the forces of Dan shall be on the north side according to their armies. And so we have a picture here of Dan, Asher, uh, the other leaders there that will be with him, and Neptulon, another brother, and their total was 157, 600,000 men on that side. Now the camp of Dan, uh, they suggest the strongest camp next after Judah. So for some reason, this side, the north side, and the east side were the strongest part of the camp. So I'm sure that has to do with strategic battling there. And then we come to the summary of Israel's order around the tabernacle, verse 32 through 34. These are the ones who were numbered of the children of Israel by their father's house, all who were numbered according to their armies of the forces were 603,500,050. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. <clears throat> now, 33. But the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they encamped by their standards, and so they broke camp, each one by his family, according to their fathers. So they're breaking camp now. The Levites start to tear down everything, and they're ready to go into battle. Just like we should be ready to go into battle every day. What do we do? We start tearing down camp in the morning. You get up, you pray, you seek the Lord, you ask for power. You ask for strength, the battle, the battles that we're going to battle. Now that takes order. This is a great picture of God's order. God is a God of order, right? Am I wrong in saying that? No. You, know, you look at the, the, the galaxies out there. They're all in order. The suns, the moons, moons, the moon. And there's other moons I'm sure out there. Uh, all these planets, they're all in order and they're rotating and they're in this perfect order. Everything is order. When there's disorder, there's confusion. When there's disorder, there's problems. Uh, you ever look at a field 
and that's in disorder and not maintained, it's awful. And you see all these weeds growing everywhere. And then you see a car popping up, the hood, at least the top of the car. And then you see trash and paper. You know, you see all kinds of strange. You're like, it doesn't look enticing at all. And then you go to a park that is just clean and cut and flowers and beauty. And you're like, I'd like to lay here for a while. Forget that other place. There's just something about beauty. You go to the mountains and, and Mammoth, the Sierra, the Sierra Mountains over there, and it's beautiful. Everything is in order. We serve a God of order. And before Israel can take the promised land, he requires that they put themselves in order. We should be a people of order. Our lives should be in order. Our families should be in order. If it's in chaos, then something's wrong. What happens is in disorder, you got too much going on. And you're doing a little bit here, and then you're doing you know, a little bit here, and then you're going to a little bit here, but you never get anything done. Now, I'm a guy of order, and you all know that already. <laughs> you all know that I'm a guy of order. I like things clean. I like lines. Oh, I even got checkerboard carpet in here. <laughs> you know, I like that. I think it represents God. I really do. And I think that's what we're seeing here. I mean, God sets all these people in front, and they're all in an order. Um, when I was in uh, India, and I went and visited an orphanage, they asked me if I could uh, teach uh, all these kids from, from the age of four all the way to age to 18. And when I came to this auditorium, it was huge, auditorium. All the kids were all over the place, hanging on the wall in monkey bars, and they're just all over. No, they had them in order. They all were on this side girls, from ages in the front going back, and they're all in line and in order, and then this side, the boys, all in line and order. When they said, okay, sit down, they all sat across their legs, and it was like an army. It looked amazing, and there were 300 and something kids in that little room, and I thought, wow. And they were quiet. They were quiet when they heard the word. I'm talking from the four-year-old. Now, how do you get kids to do that? How do you get kids to do that? Discipline. Yeah. Discipline. If your kids aren't doing that, you're not disciplining. It speaks of the parents. It speaks of the parents. And we live in a society, is, and, and I blame Mr. Spock, not Star Trek. <laughs> I'm talking about Dr. Spock, who back in the, what, 70s or so, wrote a book, who never had kids and said, do not spank your kids. Do not discipline your kids. They will grow up to be better kids if you just leave them alone. Well, look what we have today. Yeah. No, you have. You know, I know it hurts, and I know it feels like you're doing something bad to them, but you're not. You're creating very orderly, healthy, productive citizens. I couldn't believe to see all those kids sitting there, and they listen to the whole message. Once in a while, I even hear one of them go, "Amen." <laughs> Amen. You know, I wonder. I wonder when Jesus says, "Do not." keep the little children from me. I wonder if they were all sitting there listening to him. Mm. And here we are in a society where we have to put them in a classroom to be taught at their age when they possibly could be sitting here if they were disciplined. You know, My kids were disciplined. They could sit in church and listen without playing with phones, without being preoccupied, without doing anything else, but listen. You know, And, it, and if they did it, it just took a quick little on the ear. You know? <laughs> And, up, and they would listen again, you know? Just correcting them, saying this is important that we do these things. So this is order. God is a God of order. Not only is it more efficient and useful, but it's also simply more like God. Ordered and organized. That's how God is. You, you look at the temple, if you've ever gone to Israel, and it's a beautiful temple in order. Now there are limits to what we can be and what we can do for the Lord without order and organization, right? There are limits. It's not that order and organization are requirements for blessings in the Christian life. They are progress in the Christian life, becoming more like God. You might not have started off as a person of order, but you should be progressing to be a person of order. It's not required by the Lord that you have order in your life to be saved. No, you're already saved because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's, 
But as Christians, we should be in order. We should be in order. I love the fact that when seasons come and go, Virginia has everything there. They're in files, they're in places, and here we are coming up to our yard sale. Oh, I'm going to go to the yard sale file, pull everything out, and we'll just put it up. You know, that's order. You know where it's at. Where some people are like, I don't know, let me look on my desk, and you're moving stuff all over the place. Where is it? I know it's there somewhere. You know, and you can't find it. No, it should be a progress in our life. We should all be growing to be more organized and more in order like our God. Nothing is accomplished in God's kingdom without order and organization. Can you imagine a church in chaos? <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Now, the guy that's the most orderly is usually the pastor or the ones that he chooses, and they're the ones that are always picked on because they're so orderly. <laughs> By everyone else that's not as orderly, you know? And that's always a, a struggle. Of God, But you're going to see it here, and you're going to see it next week as we go through two more chapters, how God just places them in order. So th- something to think about, guys. Mm-hmm. It just keeps everything. I mean, can you imagine if the IRS calls you and says, I want to see all your receipts are being audited this year? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where your receipts are? No. No? Trash. No, you don't? Trash. See, I have a folder that says 2019, and every time I pay a bill, everything goes right in that folder. And by the end of the year, I hope folded this thick. Every bill, every receipt is mm. right there. I'm dealing with a company right now because of my blower. And they're like, when did you purchase it? Oh, let me go to my folder, and the receipt will be in there. I'll pull it out, and there's when I purchase it. So everything is in order. It's simple, it's easy, it's fast. And you know what? You get a lot more done, too. Because you, as soon as I get that, psh, well, you know, I'm done. I went today to, and I'm not boasting about myself, guys. That's, that's God. That's God because he called me to be a pastor of a church. And I think as a pastor, you need, won't be, need to be one of order. Mm-hmm. Um, Chuck was like that. Very much so. <clears throat> I went to order uh, banners today. Same thing. It's like I had all my numbers down. Everything was listed. Went in there and it took me probably about half an hour to 45 minutes to order a bunch of little um, real estate uh, state pl- banners, a couple other banners, and then also a sign for outside that we're going to be getting hopefully soon to show our name. And it's going to be looking like our blue dove and the, the whole name awesome. together. Just same colors and everything out there. But it was all in order. You know, I didn't come there and go, okay, I need a sign. Well, what size? Oh, I, I didn't measure that. Oh, let me go back and measure that and then I'll get back with you. Okay, I need... Ten other signs. Well, which way do you want the arrows pointing? Oh, I don't, I don't know. It's, how should we do it? You know, it, no, that just takes forever. You have to be in order. It helps out with everything. So, it's not good for those that are collectors, though, huh? <laughs> you know, I used to, and I'm not bashing on you guys. I love you. If those of you that are out of order. Um, <laughs> I used to work for Southern California at Edison, and I had, I had, we all had vans, you know, these white vans, kind of like the one you're driving. Um, I would get that thing waxed every week. I would wash it myself and wax it, armor all the tires. You opened up my van, everything was in drawers, they were labeled, I knew where things were. If I needed it, pull out the drawer, grab it, go and do my stuff. I went with this guy who was a primary testman. He was an Asian guy that has nothing to do with it. I just thought I'd say that. Um, and all of a sudden he's like, oh, I need this. He opens up his door, and I'm like, wow, everything's just thrown in there. <laughs> I'm sure there's stuff in the drawers, but it's all there. You couldn't even get in. How do you, oh, I find it. I, eventually I find it. You know, but you're getting paid. I'm a union. <laughs> you know, and I just look at that, I'm like, I could not live like that. I just couldn't live like that. It, it just, it wastes time, and you don't know where things are at, so. I should pray while I'm ahead. I don't even know if I'm ahead. (laughs) But I love you, and God will help you in your order, not me. I just bring it to light, and what the scriptures said, you deal with it. That's on you, not on me. And if you're still out of order, well, I still love you. And I'm not saying you have to get out. You're more than welcome to stay. I'll just put it back in order when it's out of order. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Oh, Lord, it's amazing how you are, Lord. How you keep the earth in order, Lord. How you keep, somehow you keep the earth spinning with the sun and the moon 
coming out and coming down at the right distances, bringing oxygen through the, what is it, the, the trees breathe in the, the um, carbon and then spit out the oxygen. I mean, you keep all of this in order, Lord. The sun shining, the plants growing. It's an amazing thing that you do, Lord, when we think about it. You're an amazing God. And I can't wait to get to heaven when everything will be in order. It will be awesome, Lord. You're amazing, Lord. We love you. We thank you, Lord. And just bless us, Lord. Encourage us and help us, Lord God, as we walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for putting up with me.